Okay, here we're going to be looking at using the confidence interval approach for solving a dependent t-test. Here we're going to be using practice problem number 23 on page 470. We're going to use a 0.05 significance level, and we're going to be testing the claim that among couples, males speak more words a day than females. So we're going to be using data set 17 from your textbook. So when you're opening up StatsCrunch from the Pearson site, um, you remember you have the option to either open up the stats crunch and enter the data yourself or you can select on a data set. So you're going to want to pick the option to select the data set and you're going to want to select data set number 17. So once we're working with this data, and that's going to open a big file with a lot of data, we're only going to use two columns in here. So if you look at the explanation in the back of your textbook for the data sets, they tell you a little bit more about how the data was collected and what all of that represents. So very briefly, uh, the data for M1 and, M and F1 represent the data for couples. So M1 is the male in the couple and F1 is the female in the couple. So we have this data for all these couples. So going through and looking at our requirements, uh, we, so we have a simple random sample of couples. Uh, so we're having that requirement. Now we have an N greater than 30, so it doesn't necessarily matter if uh, the population is normally distributed or not, actually. We do have a large enough N that we can proceed anyhow. And here, because they're in couples, this pairs the data together. So if these were just males and females, for example, in a conversation in the hallway or something like that, I might not consider them pair data. But because we're looking at them as a couple and we're looking at the communication within the couple, then we're going to be pairing this data. So we've accomplished our requirements that we need for going forwards, and we need to then move on and look at the specific claims that we'll be working with and connect them with the hypotheses. So let's start down here with step number three, looking at this, uh, working out the test claim that we're going to be working for, and then we'll come up and solve for the uh, null version. So here they're at telling us they're testing the claim that males speak more words a day than females. If it was true that males speak more words a day among couples, would we expect our mu d to be less than zero or greater than zero? So if you're looking at your data set, you have m1. If I was subtracting the values from f, the column f1 from the values in m1, if males spoke more words a day than females, what would I expect that difference to be? Would I expect it to be less than zero or would I expect it to be greater than zero? I'm expected to be greater than zero. Okay, so if men were speaking, let's say, uh, 900 words a day, uh, and women were speaking 800 words a day, if I was subtracting 800 from the 900, that would give me a positive value of 100 words. So we need to be looking at uh, the option of if the males did not speak more words a day than females, what would we be expecting our mu d to be? So if they were equal, speaking an equal number of words a day, we would expect our mu d to be equal to zero. So when we look at these in terms of our hypotheses, Again, we're going to be having our null is equal to zero, and our alternative in this case is mu d is greater than zero. So now we're going to calculate our confidence interval with stats crunch. So if you're going in, as we've done previously, through the stats crunch steps we've covered before, and going through stats, t stats, and then the paired option, and selecting the option for data, um, here we're going to put our M1 as our first sample and F1 as our second sample. Now, here we're going to set our confidence level. Now, you need to make sure, again, when you're working with this, that you need to set the appropriate confidence interval. So, you do, uh, we cannot specify if this is a one-tail or a two-tail test. So, if it's a two-tail test, your confidence interval is going to be 1 minus alpha, which we've worked with before. If it's a one-tail test, your confidence interval is going to be 1 minus 2 times alpha. So, looking at this video here, is the confidence, do I have a correct confidence interval of 0.95 for my alpha 0.05? So is that correct or is that not correct, given the formulas we've got here? That would, in fact, be not correct. The correct confidence interval for this problem would be 0.90. So, once we've put our confidence interval at the correct level, making sure we're paying attention to the computations we need to make if it's a two-tail or a one-tail test, We run our information, we get our output, and here we can see that we have got our lower limit of negative 3869.2 and an upper limit of 1.35. So, now that I have my confidence interval, what is going to be my next step with this? Well, I'm going to need to assess the rejection region. So, I need to uh, make an assessment 
um, in terms of whether or not I'm going to reject my null. To help in thinking about this, pay attention to uh, if we're looking at this, if my confidence since my null hypothesis includes mu d equals zero, that's what it's claiming. If my confidence interval that I've calculated contains zero, then I'm going to fail to reject the null. If the confidence interval I've created does not contain zero, that means it gets a value different than what was predicted by the null hypothesis, then I'm going to, um, then I'm going to uh, reject the null. Okay? So looking at this and making this assessment, um, does this confidence interval that we've calculated with StatsCrunch contain the value zero? Yes, it does. So we're going, uh, so we're going to fail to reject the null. It's perfectly possible that the prediction of the null is in fact incorporated within this confidence interval. So if uh, we reject the null, then we need to put restate our decision in non-technical terms to address the original claim. And here, when we're looking at this. We need to make sure we've got our alternative and our null so we can refer to them correctly when restating our decision. And we should get a language that looks like this. So here we would say we are 90% confident that the limits of negative 3869.2 and 135 actually do contain the difference between the two population means. So this is the first component in writing your conclusion from a confidence interval. You need to give your confidence interval percentage, then you need to give the two limits that you have, your lower and your upper, you need to specify that your confidence in it containing the actual real difference between the two population means. Now, the next statement is responding to whether or not that contains the zero or not claimed by mu. So here we would say because those limits do contain mu, and that is the claimed value of the population parameter in the null, this confidence interval suggests that there is not a difference between the two means. Then lastly, you're going to sum up with stating it in terms of whether it supports or does not support the alternative claim they were putting forward. So we'd say this does not support the claim that among couples, males speak more words a day than females. Now notice when you're doing your confidence interval here, again, make sure you're using the correct confidence interval. Do not put the correct confidence interval into your stats crunch calculation and then go back and write the wrong one here. So whatever confidence interval you're interrupted, putting into your stats crunch is the one that's going to go here uh, when you're stating your conclusion.